Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our third in a series of four presentations by Mav Kim. She will be giving a presentation tonight, at the end of which I will be asking her questions. So if you have questions, please, as the presentation is in progress, please type them into the chat and I will take them in the order they're received. I'm very pleased to introduce my friend and my birding mentor, Mav Kim, who has been birding for a long time. She is also an author, having written two novels and several articles for Birdwatching Magazine. We're very, very pleased. It's apt timing if everybody was outside today because yes, indeed, spring migration is here in Vermont and they are on their way. So Mav, take it away. Thank you very much, Tom. And I want to thank Green Mountain Audubon Society for this four series. It's really been fun. This four series sort of aimed at new birders, but it really is for, for birders. Um, and this, as Tom said, this is perfect. It was so warm today and people are reporting all sorts of spring migrants back. This is a very exciting time of year. There's change in the air. The sap is flowing. Our sap is flowing. <laughs> Um, every single day brings something new, snow's melting. We actually saw little green sprouts coming up in the one perennial garden bed we have that isn't still under a foot and a half of snow. Um, <clears throat> so many kinds of birds are here in Vermont all year round, but many more abandon us. They abandon the North Country entirely as soon as the leaves fall and cold winds start to blow and ice forms on open water. And spring, right now, is the time that they start coming back. So tonight we'll talk about spring migration and see some of the birds that will be returning very soon to our backyards if they didn't return today. Um, and we'll see them roughly in the order that we can expect them to come back. But first, a little bit about migration itself. Throughout history, people have tried to figure out what is going on when birds are here a while and then they're suddenly not here. Early philosophers reasoned, quite logically, that birds as other birds. For instance, Sophocles argued that hoopoes, the brightly colored birds on the left there, now the national birds of Israel, um, were exactly the same bird as that little European falcon seen on the right. They just changed. And for Aristotle, many birds spent winters in swamps or hollow trees or caves. And ages later, there's a 16th century illustration that I just love. It shows fishermen pulling up a net and the net is full of fish and swallows because people reasoned that they see the swallows disappearing out over the ocean every single fall and they see them coming back from out from the ocean they must have spent the entire winter under the sea. And in 1703, this pamphlet published in England made the argument that flying over an ocean, even a quote unquote small ocean like the Mediterranean would be unthinkably taxing for any small bird. And therefore they all must be wintering on the moon. As late as the 20th century, there were a lot of people in the U.S. who firmly, totally believed that hummingbirds migrated on the backs of Canada geese. Well, the reality of bird migration is even more fantastic than a lot of those myths and stories. Every single year, about 50 billion birds take to the air to migrate, and their journeys are really quite grueling. They often require dramatic changes in the bird's diet, and their physiology, and certainly their behavior. For example, tree swallows, insect-eating birds that weigh less than an ounce each, migrate more than 6,000 miles. That tree swallow at Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge <clears throat> might have spent our winter in the Yucatan. And Arctic terns, like this beauty that I watched courting and then mating south of Anchorage, Alaska, make round trips of over 44,000 miles. They go between the Arctic and the Antarctic twice a year. When I was a new birder, I firmly believed, I, I knew I was right, that migrating birds all come north in big, huge groups. 
and then they fly south in big, huge groups, and they follow well-defined routes called flyways. It is true that some birds migrate in well-defined groups. <clears throat> Ducks and geese and cranes need very specialized, specific wetland habitats to feed in while they're migrating. So they do follow fairly well-defined routes. And that was a really important uh, finding for the early days of habitat conservation because where they needed to land helped the U.S. Fish and Wildlife decide where to put national wildlife refuges. But that idea of big groups of the same species heading along flyways isn't useful for understanding bird migration in general. Many bird species, like yellow-rumped warblers, and this is the, the southern, I mean, the western variety of the yellow-rumped warbler, they just spread out over most of North America when they're flying from their northern breeding areas to their wintering areas in Central and South America. And many kind of birds fly in, uh, fly alone. They actually migrate alone, or they fly in loose flocks, or they fly in mixed flocks with lots of other species. Another thing I used to know when I was a new birder was that the birds that nest where we are are our birds. They're native to Vermont, they're Vermonters, and they're just reluctantly driven away from the North Country when the cold weather comes. But in fact, our breeding birds are descended from tropical species, and they spend a lot of time in the tropics, and they have um, more time actually than in Vermont. Many warblers, for example, spend only 10 to 12 weeks a year here in their breeding territories in the North. They spend 25 to 30 weeks a year in the tropics and all the rest is spent migrating. These are two lovely little warblers that we saw in our backyard last year. <clears throat> Birds are prompted to fly, to migrate rather, by something called zugenru or migratory restlessness. It appears to be triggered by various factors, but one of the most important, perhaps the most important, is the amount of daylight. However, birds often choose the exact moment to take to the air and start a flight of thousands and thousands of miles when the wind is in their favor. So people are pretty sure, scientists know what starts a bird migrating, <clears throat> but what keeps them going in the right direction? That is the focus of studies all over the world. Migratory birds appear to have a complex and multifaceted react interrelation with the world around them. And bits and pieces of that interrelation or interface are being found out or discovered or at least posited all the time, but the whole picture is still unknown. It's known that many birds use um, the sun's position in the sky to navigate, that many birds use star charts, mental star maps to navigate, and that many birds use the Earth's magnetic forces and magnetic fields to navigate. But still, it's not entirely known how a first year shorebird born way up in Canada knows where to fly and knows exactly where to end up when its parents left a few weeks earlier. For many birders, migration is primarily a cause for awe. I mean, we never forget the first time we saw a snow, huge snow geese um, fly up, a huge bash fly up when we were down at Dead Creek, or a true river of hawks filling a Texas sky, or when we share a place like Plum Island off the coast of Massachusetts with over 20,000 migrating tree swallows and have them all twittering and zipping right by our faces. And here in the North Country, spring migration is also a giant relief. It's a sign that winter is really ending. And it does make an immediately noticeable difference in our environment, in the sights and the sounds. A little over 50 species of birds can be seen in Chittenden County in January. About 110 can be seen and heard by late May. So let's meet and greet some of Vermont's spring migrants, starting with the earliest. And when I put this show together, I figured that was a good picture for March. I did not realize that we would hit over 60 today. <clears throat> but to many Vermonters, that rising cree, the conquerie, 
of um, male red-winged blackbirds is the first real sign that winter is almost over. The males come back first, often um, before we even believe that spring can be around the corner, sometimes as early as late February. And this species is one of the most abundant birds in North America. The glossy black males have bright red and yellow uh, shoulder patches or epaulets, which they can puff up or hide depending on how confident or aggressive or amorous they're feeling. And when a male red-winged blackbird is feeling confident or amorous, he will do everything he can to be noticed. He'll sit all day on high perches and just belt out that concrete song. And once a male has chosen a section of cattail swamp or marshy field for breeding territory, he defends that territory with energy and dedication and ferocity. He'll chase away other males, but he'll also attack much larger animals such as humans or horses or moose. The male's territory is as important to females as his color and his song, maybe even more so. A male who successfully defends a really good breeding territory can mate with as many as 15 females in any one breeding season. And the females also have more than one mate. Typically a quarter to a half of red-winged blackbird nestlings are sired by somebody other than the territorial male. Both the males and the females alike want to make absolutely sure that their DNA has a good chance of getting passed to the next generation. So the females start arriving two to four weeks after the males. And this is a red-winged blackbird that is not a blackbird and is not red-winged. <laughs> the females look like large darkish sparrows with streaky brown plumage and an orange wash on the throat. And as soon as they get back up here, they start checking out the local males looking for the healthiest and the strongest to father their young and checking out the territory claimed by each single male. Well, soon after the red-winged blackbirds arrive, they're joined by two other members of the blackbird family. Common grackles are larger than many other blackbirds. They have glossy iridescent bodies, longer, more tapered uh, bills and longer tails. And they use those tails when they're flying as both brakes and rudders, sometimes almost bending them slightly so that the tail is V-shaped. Grackles definitely are birds with attitude. <clears throat> they probably will never win a popularity contest, although I'm, I'm really fond of them. But many people who feed birds get a little upset when hordes of grackles descend, scare off all the littler birds, and just chow down. And they will eat just about everything, even garbage. Nationwide, grackles of three different species are the number one threat to corn crops. Here's what poet Ogden Nash thought of this handsome species. <clears throat> the grackle's voice is less than mellow. His heart is black. His eye is yellow. He bullies more attractive birds with hoodlum deeds and vulgar words. And should a human interfere, he attacks that human in the rear. I cannot help but deem the grackle an ornithological debacle. At about the same time as grackles, or maybe just a little bit later, although I've heard that they're around today, um, Vermonters start seeing brown-headed cowbirds, another member of the blackbird family. These are small, stocky blackbirds. The males have a beautiful brown head and glossy black body, and the females are all a soft brownish gray color. And these little birds have a fascinating evolutionary history. They used to be found only in the open grasslands of uh, middle North America, and they evolved to follow vast herds of big mammals, like woolly mammoths or bison, and they would eat the insects that flew up around, around the uh, animal's feet. Well, that meant they couldn't, they had to keep following the, the herds. They couldn't stop to nest. So they evolved a crafty solution to the problem. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, and they very often choose nests of birds whose young are smaller than theirs are. This is an amazing picture taken by a St. Albans birder and photographer. 
the host birds, in this case, an American red start, end up dedicating a large proportion of their time and effort toward feeding the biggest chick in the nest, often not even recognizing that it's a different species. This picture reminds me, by the way, that unless otherwise noted, all the photos in this presentation were taken by me or by my partner, Bernie Paquette, and the vast majority were taken by him. So when we're out driving in March, and we saw one of these just a few days ago, we might notice a large soaring bird, and we might wonder, hawk, raven, eagle? Well, it could be a returning vulture. Turkey vultures are huge birds with wingspans up to 70 feet, and they often soar with their wings held in a slate dihedral, which means they make open V shape. And turkey vultures, all vultures, are true wind masters. They're able to float without flapping at all, just tipping from side to side to make the most of all the wind. Turkey vultures are carrion eaters, <clears throat> and they use their sense of smell to find rotting meat. And they are extremely good at finding carrion, even when it's hidden below a for forest canopy, or even if it's an area where they don't usually hang out. We almost never see turkey vultures in or above our yard here, except for the two years that there were sheep next door. Right after the sheep dropped their lambs, turkey vultures appeared. It was nature's cleanup crew coming to eat the afterbirths and possibly eat any stillborn lamb. Another really big bird that returns in um, March very often, <clears throat> and people tend to take as the sign of spring, even though a lot of them are seen even at Christmas bird count, is a great blue heron. They're March, but they're very often here through December. And this probably is one of the most widely recognized birds in the state. They're the most common and the largest of North American herons. They often breed in colonies and they put really messy looking stick nests high in dead or dying trees. If you're driving toward the sandbar causeway and you look to your left, you'll see a lot of osprey nests on man-made platforms on power poles. But then you'll also see several great blue heron nests in trees in back of them. Great blue herons hunt by walking very slowly or by standing completely still and waiting for prey to come by, usually fish and frogs. They kill with a quick stab of that huge beak and then swallow it whole. In addition to fish and frogs, though, they also eat larger insects and other small creatures. In fact, mice constitute a really good proportion of great blue herons' diets. Some other birds start showing up in small numbers in Vermont in late March or early April, especially in years when the lakes and ponds aren't totally frozen. Osprey can be seen in the skies over Lake Champlain, Arrowhead Mountain Lake, other bodies of water in the state. And killdeer, down on the bottom left there, start making their plaintive cries in farm fields and pastures, and they may actually start looking for nesting areas, sometimes on the flat roofs of uh, the gravel tops, rather, of flat roofed buildings. And double crested cormorants also show up, that top uh, right picture. Those are diving fish eaters. And this big beauty was furnished, uh, uh, photographed rather, at the Shelburne Bay fishing access on Bay Road. I believe that was June, though. And the other two weird looking birds with the long, long bills are American woodcocks on the top and Wilson snipe. They're both in the shorebird family, though they spend none of their lives on seashores. These are birds of swamps and wetlands. They probe in the mud for tasty worms and crustaceans using those long outsized bills. Well, all of those species, the osprey and the killdeer, these, the snipe, the woodcock and the cormorant are wonderful and fascinating. But we won't spend a lot of time with them tonight because they really don't visit backyards and they often go unnoticed unless one drives around looking at swamps, wetlands, marshes, etc. Well, the next bird isn't a backyard bird either, but it's too gorgeous not to just enjoy for a few minutes and I'll let it introduce April. 
the number of birds coming to Vermont in April skyrockets. Great egrets, like that picture, aren't seen by every birder on every outing, but they're not, and they're not backyard birds, unless of course you live by a swamp or a lake, but they are far from rare in the state now. Their numbers have been increasing for many years now. They are almost as big as great blue herons, and they hunt in classic heron fashion, standing immobile or wading in slow motion, and then catching fish with deadly jabs of their bill. In the late 19th century, these beautiful birds were killed in huge numbers to satisfy the fashion industry's demand for plumes on ladies' hats. Revulsion about that carnage was the prime reason, actually, that the National Audubon Society was formed. Great egrets are beautiful any time of the year. But they're even more beautiful during breeding season. A patch of skin on the face turns neon chartreuse. <laughs> Those long plumes are flashed around. I watched this bird for almost an hour as he spread those plumes, shook them, stamped his feet up and down, raised and lowered his head, all in an ultimately successful attempt to catch the eye of one of the females behind him. Now let's look at some smaller late April arrivals. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers are closely related to woodpeckers, but they have to leave, well, almost all of them leave, which most of our woodpeckers don't, because they, they need sap. <laughs> they can't live here while it's so cold. And instead of making really large holes to dig out grubs or ants, sapsuckers make rows of little tiny holes in trees, and then they insert their bills and their very long tongues to get sap and also to get small insects that are either trapped in or attracted by the sap. And the birds have to return to their little wells regularly to keep the sap flowing. And other animals know about sapsucker wells. In some parts of North America, ruby-throated hummingbirds time their return to the north with the arrival of sapsuckers so that they will have an easy source of sugar before many flowers are out. There are other birds and bats and porcupines also visit sapsucker sap wells. Now most thrushes and swallows arrive later than April, <clears throat> but two vanguard species come way before the, most of their close relatives. Tree swallows, which you saw a few minutes ago, get here before other swallows. They are often the first insectivorous or bug-eating birds to return to the Northeast. These small, handsome birds breed in open habitats such as fields and wetlands, usually, but not always, adjacent to water. And they nest in tree cavities, but they readily accept homemade nesting places, such as bluebird boxes. Now, migratory birds have to balance the advantages of getting back to the breeding territory early, being the first there to claim the best territory, with the risk of getting there, the almost fatal risk, of getting back too early, before there's an adequate food supply. Insectivorous birds can be in real trouble <clears throat> if they get here before there are enough insects to, to keep them alive, and that happens in cold, wet, late springs, like we had last in May in 2020. Remember the two main uh, May snowstorms? One time I was birding at Point Pedley, which is a little um, peninsula that sticks down into Lake Erie, south of Toronto. And one of the beaches there was cordoned off. No birders were allowed in. And that is because tens of thousands, <clears throat> they had just flown, <clears throat> they had just flown over the icy, icy Lake Erie. They used up all their reserves of fat and strength. It had been a cold, wet spring. And when they got there, there were no insects for them to eat. The bugs that they expected, the bugs they needed to survive, hadn't hatched out yet. Birders were, of course, appalled. But a naturalist explained that this kind of event happens quite often and seems to affect the numbers of tree swallows for that one summer only, because there are going to be some more tree swallows who got a late start. And when they get there, there's no competition for food, 
there's no competition for breeding territory. The females, there are lots of insects have hatched out by then. The females are healthy and well-fed and produce many eggs. And there was enough food to raise lots and lots of healthy youngsters. So by the very next summer, the population of tree swallows in that part of Canada would be back to normal. Nature tends to recover quickly from natural vicissitudes, such as a cold, wet spring, a hard winter, even a hurricane. It does not recover quickly from man-made disasters, such as oil spills or climate change. Now, hermit thrushes, Vermont state birds since 1941, are usually the first of the migratory thrushes to return in the spring. Brown upper body and smudgy spots on its breast and a reddish tail, which help distinguish it from similar species. In some parts of the US, the hermit thrush used to be called the American nightingale because of this lovely song. Standing by a woods and hearing that at dusk is just ethereal. Another bird that returns in late April <clears throat> also are gray catbirds. They are named catbird for their mewing call, but they have so many other noises. They can imitate birds and frogs and mechanical noises made by humans and many other sounds. And they string the phrases together, the, they set noises together rather in long phrases that can last several minutes. Ruby crowned kinglets also return to Vermont by April. These tiny birds, smaller than chickadees, are pretty nondescript. They're plain gray green with that white, it's not really an eye ring, but two little white commas and a pale bar on the wing. But they appear to have limitless energy. They forage almost frantically, usually through lower branches of shrubs and trees, constantly flicking their wings. And the male's ruby crown usually stays hidden. But when the tiny bird becomes excited or by courtship or by another male entering its territory, it flashes like a neon sign. This photo was taken at Woodside Natural Area in Essex Junction, which is a great place to see kinglets in the spring, during spring migration. April also sees several kinds of sparrows returning to Vermont, <clears throat> including clockwise from left, chipping sparrows, swamp sparrows, savanna sparrows on the bottom right, and field sparrows. In sheer numbers, all of these are outweighed by the familiar song sparrow. These birds breed throughout Southern Canada and New England, and they number over a hundred million. <laughs> They're found in backyards and parks, uh, sub suburbs, prairies, forests, the forest edges, Arctic grasslands, tidal marshes, even Pacific rainforests. They don't seem to be particularly afraid of humans. They sometimes nest close to houses or right beside flower beds or vegetable gardens. In our yard, song sparrows have nested in lilacs, hydrangeas, and other shrubs. Song sparrows are best recognized for their brown and tan stripes and streaky breasts, and with the streaks sort of coagulating into a central spot. They're relatively long tailed sparrows. <laughs> Although this little guy, who's photographed when he was only a few weeks old, hadn't even grown any tail yet. I'm going to step out of chronological order just a little bit so I can put the two next two birds together, because they are both iconic grassland birds. The first eastern meadowlark usually shows up in Vermont in early April, even late March. Meadowlarks used to breed in great numbers on small family farms with grassy fields and pastures. They do not do well with modern industrial agriculture, pesticides, herbicides, overgrazing, acres and acres of row crops. Both meadowlarks and bobolinks face threats to both their winter habitat and their summer breeding habitat. The world population of eastern meadowlarks is down almost 90% since the 1960s, and that of bobolinks has declined by over 
Bobolinks often don't return to Vermont until May. These birds breed throughout most of the United States and Southern Canada, and they spend winters south of the equator, making annual trips of over 12,000 miles. Biologists right here at our own Vermont Center for Eco Studies are hemispheric leaders in researching reasons for the decline in bobolinks and other grassland birds, and in developing cooperative agreements with colleagues in Canada and South America and Central America to protect both the breeding grounds and the wintering areas. And there's also an exciting project that started in Connecticut and has fortunately spread to other states logically called the Bobolink Project. <clears throat> People donate money and then it is used to reimburse farmers for lost income if they agree to delay mowing their hay fields until Bobolinks and other grassland birds have fledged, have had time to fledge at least one clutch. To help, just Google Bobolink Project. Then in late April or early to mid-May, house wrens come back and they start checking out lots of man-made nesting boxes. These birds are really well-named. They like to nest close to human habitation. They often take over boxes that people set out hoping to attract bluebirds. But they'll also nest in old tin cans, boots, boxes lying around in your garage. I read about one farmer who used to hang his work jacket in an open porch. And he was startled one morning to find that a pocket was full of twigs. So he emptied out the twigs. Same thing happened the next morning and he emptied out the twigs. And then a third morning, a very energetic and determined house wren had decided to nest in that pocket. And a determined house wren is determined indeed. The males fill several potential nesting cavity with twigs and the female chooses one to nest in. Look at this box and you'll see there are twigs coming out of every section. <laughs> every possible opening. And the twigs make a bed for the soft lined cup and also make a barrier between the nest and the entrance. Could be for protection against cold weather or predators or cowbirds. If you have a house wren in your yard, you will know it. Both males and females sing. <clears throat> the males, often as many as 10, as much as 10 times a minute um, during the breeding season. I'm going to find you the, the wren song here. Wren. And they also aggressively chatter at any human who walks by their nesting cavity. I used to have a, a, a pair nesting in every time I came by. Here's a male house wren's bubbly song. Ten times a minute sometimes. And now it's May. And in May, birds are everywhere. New species arrive every single day. Eastern Phoebes are another bird that often chooses to nest near humans. I've seen the nests of these in barns, under the eaves of houses, on porches, in potted plants, on outdoor light fixtures. Two characteristics make the Phoebe relatively easy to identify. First, it says its name over and over in a loud, raspy, Phoebe, Phoebe. And second, Phoebe sit really upright. They're usually on low perches where they can look for insects and they wag their tails a lot. And Eastern Phoebe, as far as anyone knows, was the first North American bird ever banded. John James Audubon tied a piece of silver thread to a Phoebe's leg way back in 1804 hoping to find that same bird in later years. Well, Phoebes are insectivorous, they're bug eaters. And anyone who gardens or works outside in their yard in May knows that it's not just birds who show up, it, it is bugs. So by May, we have lots of bugs and lots of birds that love to eat those bugs. Some poke around in the mud for insects. Others walk around on the lawn looking for bugs. Some glean for bugs high in the trees taking tasty morsels from leaves or lifting bits of bark to find them. Others, like the Phoebe and other flycatchers and swallows, 
catch insects on the wing. And as mentioned before, tree swallows are the first to come to Vermont. Barn swallows are often the second. And they can be recognized by the long, deeply forked tail. They often cruise low, just a few inches above ground or water. These beautiful birds are well-named because they often choose man-made structures like barns or the underneath of, of bridges um, for nesting. They construct cup-shaped nests out of mud. This pair started nesting on a light fixture at the visitor center on Burton Island State Park. And we don't know whether they kept with this nesting site once they discovered the light stays on all night. Vermont has several other kinds of swallows, but I'll mention only one more. And it's one that most of us in Chittenden County, unfortunately, won't see in our yards. But if we head up to Shore Acres Restaurant in North Hero for a delicious, delicious dinner on the lake, you will see a big, big colony of purple martins. And there's another well-established colony not far from the Champlain Bridge on Route 125. Purple martins are the largest swallows in our area and the latest to get back north in the spring. <clears throat> Traditionally, they nested in woodpecker poles, but now they are, they're often found nesting in special martin houses. Native Americans used to put out empty gourds for martins to nest in, and many of the modern plastic nests are made to look like that. John James Audubon used the presence or absence of martin houses to help him choose where to stay for a night. In 1831, he remarked, almost every country tavern has a martin box on the upper part of its signboard. I have noticed the handsomer the box, the better the inn. Well, May also brings back an interesting and vocal family of birds to Vermont, vireos. These are small birds that often stay high in the treetops, but we hear them even if we don't always see them. <clears throat> Warbling vireo on its breeding territory starts singing the minute the sun warms up the trees and keeps singing all day long. Birders sometimes use a mnemonic for this bird's song. The mnemonic is, if I see you, I will seize you and I'll squeeze you till you squeak. Here's the song. And red-eyed vireos, if possible, sing even more frequently. One Canadian man, apparently with a lot of time on his hand and curiosity, spent an entire day counting the number of songs sung by a single red-eyed vireo male seeking a mate. And that little bird sang 22,197 times in that one day. These are feisty little birds. This uh, vireo is nipping Mark Labar's fingers to protest about having been caught in the mist net and then given a leg band. May also brings back some glorious colored birds. Male indigo buntings have been described as blue canaries or like a scrap of sky with wings. The females are mostly brown, mostly sometimes with a touch of blue on the wheel, wings or tail or rump. <clears throat> They're sparrow sized birds. They're widespread and they can be found in weedy fields, um, shrubby areas near trees. And they love, like so many other birds, hedgerows. Rose-breasted grosbeaks also return to Vermont in May, and it's a lucky person that has these nesting in, in their yard. The aptly named males and the quiet colored females. And one of the most welcomed and beloved of all backyard birds, the ruby-throated hummingbird comes back also in May. This is the only species of hummingbird that nests east of the Mississippi. And the return of these little bundles of energy every May is always exciting. These birds beat their wings about 53 times a second. So they need lots of food to fuel that kind of activity. And they forage most of the day for nectar and small insects. But they do stop moving sometimes and spend many minutes at a time perching, preening like this little guy. Imagine trying to preen with a bill that long and then also looking around alertly for any other hummer that might be encroaching on their territory. 
And females don't have that flashing scarlet throat, but they're still just lovely little birds. Feeding hummingbirds is a very satisfying endeavor. Don't buy the red colored stuff sold as hummingbird food. The red dye might have long-term health effects and don't, it's not needed. Just boil together one cup of plain white sugar and four cups of water, cool it and put it in a nectar feeder and sit back to watch the fun. Keep the feeders rinsed out and clean, replace the nectar often, and you'll be rewarded with tiny little buzzing birds from May through August. And many native flowers also attract hummingbirds, including bee balm, cardinal flower, fox gloves, and others. Well, it'll be so much fun to show you all the other birds that come back in, to Vermont in May, but there simply is not time. So let's take a quick look at some of the beauties that we've seen in our own backyard or on walks around Jericho. This lovely little common yellow throat is a good example of the huge group of birds called warblers. But this one's kinder to us humans than many warblers. It doesn't hang out way up in the uppermost tree branches. It doesn't hide in dense foliage and it isn't in constant motion. Common yellow throats flit around a lot to be sure, but they tend to stay no higher than 15 feet above the ground and often lower. And they even nest close to the ground. And they're either very curious about people or they're super alert to protecting their nest sites or both. If we stand in one place and make the noise that birders call pishing, psh, 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 and there's any common yellow throat around, he, usually he, but sometimes a she, will pop right out from the underbrush and give us a look. This year we had at least one pair of common yellow throats nesting on our property and had the delightful uh, experience of watching them bring their young around the yard in the late August and early September. The young don't look exactly like this, but quite similar. Two other warblers nest in our yard most years, and those are the ones on the right, American red starts and chestnut sided warblers. And many others pass through each spring during migration and then again in the fall. The Cape May warbler and the Nashville warbler on the left. The Cape May came through in the spring, as you can see by the blossoms, and the Nashville in the, in the fall. These migrating birds are attracted to our yard by flowering apple trees, cherry trees, and plums. During spring and fall 2020, we saw 17 species of warblers right in our own backyard. And this past spring, 2020, was an amazing year for Baltimore Orioles at backyard feeders all over New England. This species is often wary of getting too close to houses, but they came north right on schedule and there were none of the flowers and none of the bugs that would normally be here. The birds were starving. They were willing to overcome their innate weariness of humans and come close to houses to get suet and oranges and jelly and nectar. From all over the state, people started reporting not one, not two, but flocks of Orioles chowing down. This is a first year male, by the way. He doesn't have his, his full um, coloring yet. We put out extra nectar feeders like um, hummingbird feeders. We cut oranges in half. We put out spoonfuls of the previous year's current jelly and the starving birds ate it all and gave us a once in a lifetime chance to see a flock of Orioles close up every day for several weeks. Before we leave each other this evening, let's just spend one moment with two species of birds that many people think of as harbingers of spring, but really aren't. Robins and bluebirds can be found all year in many parts of Vermont, including here in Chittenden County. Both kinds of birds eat fruit during the winter. So they're especially prevalent after summers and falls that had good crops of berries, ornamental crab apples, wild grapes, and other fruits. One South Burlington woman was considerably startled to look out on a frigid February day and see 70 robins chowing down on rose hips on her hedge in her hedge of multiflora roses. And I've seen flocks of robins numbering over a hundred in the winter, but usually not here in Jericho, usually in Shalott or Shelburne or Ferrisburg. 
It's not known if the robins that we see here in the winter are the exact same birds that nested here the previous spring or will nest here the coming spring. Our wintering robins might be individuals who spent the summer further north in Canada. But the few wintering bluebirds we see, however, are thought to be year-round residents of Vermont. Well, we have seen <clears throat> almost 40 species of birds so far. Vultures to herons, woodpeckers, thrushes, flycatchers, all the way to tiny hummingbirds, from quiet colored catbirds and kinglets to showy orioles. And we have not even mentioned so many bird species that return to Vermont during spring migration, usually starting in May, including falcons, hawks, terns, more kinds of herons, many kinds of ducks, and even more. We're right at the beginning of spring migration here in the northern Vermont. What can we see now? What are we going to see tomorrow? What can we see next week? We are in a very exciting time of year, and I hope you all get outside and enjoy the birds. And thank you for coming. Now, are there any questions? If you have any questions, simply type them into the chat and I will read them for Mav. While people are thinking of the questions, I see none at the moment. Mav, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for presenting yet another excellent program. Great visuals, nice poetry. Mm -hmm. Truly, one can find out that all one has to do is follow your advice and get outside to enjoy birds, and one can learn and see what you have shown us tonight. Ah, oh, here we have a couple questions. Thank so um, I'm going to take them in order. And the first one was, um, what can I do to attract more birds? Oh, I love that question. Two very important things. The first is cut down on your lawn size. Lawns are worthless, they feed nothing. And two, increase the amount of, nat of a native species of plant you have in your backyard. And Audubon, by the way, has a great uh, website, Audubon, the, the National Audubon, where you put in your zip code and it'll tell you what are native species of um, uh, perennials and shrubs and trees. Uh, we've been increasing ours tremendously. <laughs> And we've also increased the amount of fruiting um, plants. We now have, I think, 22 different plants, shrubs and trees that produce fruits. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're getting more and more um, birds in our backyard. Of course, realistically, we may have seen more last year just because we were here because of COVID. <laughs> but but I definitely, um, native plants are the way to go. And there are many, many bird-friendly plants. Um, there's um, a lot of research about bird friendly plants that really is wonderful. Any other questions? Oh, there are tons of questions. Here okay. we go. Okay. Um, the next question is, is there an ideal food to put in feeders now? Well, we have found that hulled sunflower seed, not with the shells on, pleases almost every kind of bird. We have woodpeckers eating it. Um, uh, we had a Carolina wren eating it. We have titmice and chickadees. And um, it also means that you don't end up with a mess on the yard uh, of all the hulls, which can rot and, and spread disease. So I would say that's number one. But many people have discovered that if you have a variety of food out there and a variety of feeder types, you're probably gonna get more birds. Um, so, no, there's not one perfect one, but boy, I think hulled sunflower is pretty close. Next question, Mav. Do you feed bluebirds? I'd love to. We've only seen bluebirds in our backyard twice in all the years I have, and I've been here since 86. Um, the people next door have two bluebird boxes, and one year they did have a nesting pair. Um, and that was one of the years I saw bluebirds in our backyard. There are bluebirds within a mile of us all the time, but I think our yard is too, we have too many big trees around, not enough open space. Um, we have bluebird boxes, but they're almost always actually house wren boxes. The next <laughs> question I'm going to answer, it is, uh, did I see a European starling today? Um, 
yes, more than likely they've been here for weeks. Actually, I don't know if they overwinter, but I've been seeing starlings for weeks on end. The next, but the next question I'm gonna, we have a whole lot of questions, Mav, so okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be timely. Do, okay. tip, do tufted titmice migrate or are they here all winter? Man, I believe, I'd have to look this up. They didn't use to be here at all. That's one of the species that has increased their range and moved northward. But we see them every single month of the year here. They come to our feeders all winter long. So I'm going to say they're not migratory. But if you're curious, you know, Google it and go to the Cornell site and look it up. <laughs> um, but I don't believe they migrate. And somebody just asked uh, if I would turn on my video. So to whomever, uh, Hello. Next question. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you put out oranges for Orioles when you live in bear country? Ah, that's a really good question for us up in Jericho because the bears are going to be coming out pretty soon. But I, we researched that last year and we just we found out and I hope it's accurate that um, bears rarely take hummingbird food feeders and aren't interested in oranges. I hope that's true. Uh, I would not leave suet out. Um, I think if bears are already in your yard because of something else that attracted them, they might discover um, hummingbird feeders, but it, there's no smell, so it doesn't draw them. Two comments, and unless there are more, this will be served as our ending of this third in the fourth series. Thank you so much, Mav, for yet another wonderful program. And Terry Marin, a friend says, can't wait for spring migration. So <laughs> thank you for the lovely photos and the informative presentation. Mav, we look forward to your fourth part of the series. Uh, check out the Green Mountain Audubon website. We have, I think, uh, two upcoming and we are co-hosting with North Branch Nature Center. I wish all of you a wonderful weekend. Get your binoculars ready, get outside, as Mav says, enjoy birds and good evening. Thank you very much for attending.